a compliment to you and all the horror composers is that when I'm scared and I watch a horror movie, I don't do this, I do this. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been a sampler jockey and uh, even 40 years later, it's not boring yet. So that's, <laughs> I don't think it ever will be. <laughs> Never will be, yeah. yeah. Uh, initially, what happened was I was obsessed, you know, with pop and EDM production. And then I realized also like sampling, I always thought kick drums, you know, were just come from a sample pack online, you know, like the eggs come out of the fridge, not the chicken. You're like kind of dumb, you know. And I was like, okay, I can, you can actually do the drums yourself. You can record them. And then I realized you can synthesize them, which is the cheaper method that offers more control too. And then, you know, with IR reverbs and whatnot, uh, I managed to make, you know, big sounding drums. And then that led me to trailer sound design, where I think it's really the most, uh, like, high production, large sounding, with all the mixed tricks possible, mixed in one tiny sound. Um, so yeah, I just got obsessed with whoosh hits for like three years. <laughs> <laughs> I came into this in the 1980s when I first, uh, first played around with the original Fairlight series too, uh, was fascinated by uh, Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel's use of those systems. And as soon as samplers became somewhat not affordable, but within reach of, of a college kid like me, uh, back in those days, of course, it was samplers like the Emulator 2, and which I couldn't afford, but I could afford an Insonic Mirage, which is terrible, but terrible in a great way. And, uh, so I've, I've, even though there's a lot of synthesizers in this room and in my background, my first love has always been samplers and manipulating sound that, whether it's things that I find, that sounds that I find on the street or sounds that uh, come from musical instruments that I can then further manipulate by, in the old days, it was all you could really do was pitch things down or turn them backwards and not much else. But in the past, 40 years, there's been a lot of uh, advancement in how far you can go to wreck a sound. So I'm glad that, that the technology has improved so much and now we have crazy tools for starting with a sound that isn't just a raw waveform from a synthesizer, but has some uh, organic footprint, some kind of history to it, some meaning that can hopefully survive all of the manipulation and destruction that these amazing tools that we now have uh, will let you apply. You know, I remember seeing an early VHS documentary about Peter Gabriel recording samples into his Fairlight uh, out in a junkyard smashing television sets with a sledgehammer, and I thought this is just the greatest thing ever. So from that point forward, this must have been in the mid-1980s or so, and from, from that point forward, at the time I was living in New York City, and I was always carried with me a, a cassette Walkman that could record, and had built-in microphones and everything. Quality was terrible, but it let me snatch up sounds that I might stumble across in everyday life. And there was one, I, I always remember standing on the platform at the 72nd Street Station, and the old rusty, clanky New York subway cars would pull into the station and have this, this squealing sound from their brakes and from their metal wheels rubbing on the tracks and in the subway tunnel it's echoing and it's reverberant it just sounded so it, it sounded almost terrifying in a way um, and so I recorded it on a, on this cassette Walkman and then sampled it I can't remember what sampler I was using back then it was probably an Akai S900 but I've kept that sound these actual samples from the 80s around and I still use them to this day and uh, I think I've got it here which in its, in its normal pitch, it sounds something like, it sounds very much like the subway pulling into the station. But after, by, the, by the time I recorded this sound, I had already been working with samplers and I kind of had started to, to develop a, an ear for the potential for that sound. I knew I wasn't gonna use it like that, but I knew that it had some sonic sonically interesting characteristics to it so I made sure to record it every every day when I would wait for the subway and many years later we have it here on the keyboard but I never use it on its normal pitches 
but when you play it down two or three or four or more octaves, it becomes almost like a string texture, very evocative and haunting with a kind of internal motion to it that if you hold the key down, it evolves and new sonic events transpire. And it just became, that's a sound that I still to this day use on a lot of scores, even though it's, it's 40 years old now. It never kind of, it hasn't worn out its welcome yet. But those are the kind of uh, little happy accidents that I like to be prepared for and like to carry around a recorder and so I can snatch up anything that sounds interesting out in the outside world. Have you ever recorded like cool stuff like in your house, like maybe in your bathroom or that you sampled or? Yeah, a lot of, but it's never sort of the kitchen drawer full of forks mm -hmm. kind of thing. Although there was, there was a sound that I didn't record that I was really impressed by though, that was used in the uh, main title sequence to the TV series, American Horror Story, which I co-composed that theme with a guy who had done a, a, a very scratchy demo in his college room. And he had these sort of time-stretched granular sounds that were all distorted and sound almost like chainsaws. They kind of went and they decayed. And I remember asking him, what are those insane sounds? And he said it was the sound of him taking a handful of wire coat hangers and throwing it on the floor in the tiled bathroom in his college dorm. Lovely. And he recorded that on like his Dell desktop computer with like mm -hmm. the gooseneck mic that comes free with the computer, you know. And he then put them into, I think, Cool Edit Pro. Remember that old software? And he put them into Cool Edit and time stretched them by 800% or something ridiculous. And it turned them into this really heavy distorted texture, which bears no resemblance to the sound of coat hangers yeah, hitting the floor, yeah. but yeah. was at the time was interesting to him as a starting point. And it became kind of the trademark sound of this main title sequence, which I tried in vain to improve upon or to duplicate or make my own version of. And we wound up using the original recordings that he had done in his dorm room so many years earlier because they just had a certain character that was integral to the sound of this piece of music. Nice. Yeah, another cool ones I was always thinking of. Um, in trailer, it's also very common. I keep hearing uh, the doors, the door crack, you know, the ee ee. Mm -hmm. Then when you pitch it down, it sounds like an elephant. And once you distort that, then it's just like a trailer signature sounds. Um, so that seems, yeah, a new trend. And another cool one that I heard in all the records, I think it was Marlon Manson. Uh, this is the new, I can't say the word. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a drill, you know? And you know, with a drill, you have a tonal sound into it, so you can use that, you know, sample it and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I'm always obsessed, you know, by finding, you know, you think you have to be in a big studio to get cool sounds, but a lot of the small things around your room, they don't have to be big either. Like sometimes just, you know, this little click, pitch down, four octaves, like you do. It becomes like, a thundering thump. Yeah, there's so yeah. much magic, you know, in that stuff. Um, so yeah, I think it can inspire, you know, anyone to record anything around them. No, there's no one device that I couldn't live without, but if I had to live without the family of devices known as pitch shifters, then I'd be in trouble because <laughs> I do a lot of pitch, pitching things down without changing their time or adding, using a pitch shifter to add an octave below something. Uh, and I still rely on the old Digitech red whammy pedal, which is tucked safely away at the back of the pedal board. And because it has a certain kind of low fidelity, hard sound to it, and uh, I have lots of other pitch shifters, but that thing still has its, its own aggressive and solid sound. So I'd say pitch shifters. Can't live without them. What about you? Uh, let's see. Uh, no, that's <laughs> a really good one. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, to balance also on pitch shifting, I also really like uh, format shifting. So you basically keep the same pitch. Like the perfect example is if you have a boom, a hit that's already really low, you like where the fundamental is, but the upper harmonics sound a bit cheap, a bit plasticky or something, you never know. Uh, so usually, you know, format shifting, you have that, you know, in auto-tune, so it's changing the voice from the male to female, for example. And if you do that on a hit, you keep the fundamental intact, but change the, how do you say that, um, yeah, the harmonics, it just feels deeper. And it's a, a similar feeling to pitch shifting, but you preserve the fundamentals. So I like to use that a lot. 
And then of course, yeah, pitch shifters. I use Ableton, so do you, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, all the warp algorithms are really, really good. Uh, and yeah, also stretching stuff and then you keep them rhythmically, you know, in the same position. Uh, that's also really interesting. But if not Desert Island, I'd have to go with X for Serum, for sure. <laughs> that's just like Steve Duda, the man who made it himself over 10 years, just understood, I think, uh, synthesis at a very, very pure level and simplified it. And the simplification is the hardest part and he nailed it. So, yeah. X and Steve Serum. is an old, old friend of ours oh, wow. and former employee of Nine Inch Nails. Because he was cutting samples at a time, I believe, right? We, he, at, the origin of his involvement with Nine Inch Nails was that I was kind of the computer wizard in the Nine Inch Nails camp and spent a lot of time on the phone to tech support at DigiDesign, which is now Avid, trying to get our Pro Tools systems to work. So we had a whole bunch of systems and we were syncing to analog tape and all that. And they got so, uh, you know, I'm friends with a lot of the early employees from DigiDesign, but they kind of got so frustrated with how often we were calling them that they said, I'm going to give you the home phone number of one of our best tech support and guys. It was Steve, of course. And it was Steve. Yeah. And I talked to him so frequently that eventually I said, would you be interested in moving to Louisiana <laughs> to be a full-time, uh, to help us wrangle these problems full-time? And he did, became, became an employee of Nine Inch Nails, moved to Louisiana, joined us at our studio there. And uh, it was during that phase that he did things like Remember the old program Rebirth from Propeller Heads, Very which old, was yeah. three, uh, yeah. 808 and a 909 and two 303s. At the time, you couldn't dump your own samples in. You couldn't do the Rebirth mods, as they call them now. But Steve figured out a way to crack open the software and find where the WAV files of the drum samples were stored and allow us to put our own samples into it before the era of Rebirth mods that they made it a user feature. Uh, so for a while there, thanks to Steve, yeah. we were the only people in town that had our own samples inside Rebirth. And you can hear oh, that nice. on some songs on the Nine Inch Nails album, The Fragile, uh, specifically on the song The Wretched, where the main drum pattern is some samples from my collection that he somehow crowbarred in there and we played them out of the, and sequenced them and played them out of the uh, Rebirth engine, courtesy of Steve. That's amazing. Wow. Yeah, Steve, I mean, I think changed the industry for everyone. I mean, for me, for you, for mm -hmm. just like, yeah, what a man. Quite influential. Yeah, yeah. yeah very influential. Um, and also the program, the, the concept of doing uh, multi-mic drum libraries, which is now very common, where mm -hmm. you hit one key and you see 16 VU meters mm -hmm. fire off, and you can hear the sound of the tom-tom bleeding into the snare mic and all that. That was another concept oh, that Steve yeah. and I came up with in the middle of the night after one too many <laughs> and at the time because we had just done a series of drum recordings for the nine inch nails album and we were going to turn them into individual samples to so that we could sequence them on the computer but of course that meant we had to mix everything down to stereo and so steve and i sat there thinking you know it would be cool man <laughs> if somehow you hit one key but it fires on all so that our producer and mixer Alan Mulder could mix the drum samples as if they were coming off tape where you still hear the bleed from the different microphones and we Steve painstakingly edited these recording sessions into single hits in 16 wide 16 channel wide of course there were no software samplers of any kind at that time we had to try to implement this in a in a rack of emulator 4 rack modules which were not up to the task so we had to use an entire sampler just for the kick drum samples, a whole nother one just for the snares and so on. But it proved that the concept was valid and that someday the technology would catch up to it. And, and so he was into, he worked with F Expansion on the creation BFD, of BFD, right? yeah, which yeah. was, that was him. kind of the yeah. first commercial mm -hmm. product that used that late night idea that we came up with. And I mean, it was many years later before the technology caught up to our grandiose dreams yeah. but that was really another one of steve's That's accomplishments crazy. yeah and now it's that t that principle is used in everything from the abbey road drums in native instruments complete yep. to addictive drums I use tools, a lot too, yeah. string libraries which have multiple mic positions yeah. so the principle was sound it just took a few decades for the technology to catch up i think to what steve was thinking of in the middle of the night mm -hmm. And also he has like simple plugins that are available for free. I don't know if you guys use OTT. Probably not in, you know, That's the over the top compressor. Yeah, yeah. 
So it was a plugin, well, a stock plugin from Ableton, a preset in the multiband dynamics section that was over the top, you know, upwards, downwards expansions on three bands. And essentially, it was so used by Skrillex that Zed wanted to use it. And so Steve was like, oh, you want to use it? I'll make you a free copy for you. And now the copy is available for free for everyone. And I think that is like, a, I mean, I don't know if you use it. Or at all, or yeah. Mm -hmm. Sitting right there in plugin folder. Yeah, it's one of these things where you just drop it on something and it auto mixes because it forces all the bands to aim at a certain volume. Uh, so yeah, on basses, on vocals, on hits. Um, it's very easy to overdo, obviously, but in small amounts, it's really tasteful. Yeah. Well, I do love yeah. mixing the ultra expensive, ultra fancy stuff, whether it's software tools or hardware stuff, with the cheap and cheerful things that might seem at first like they're just for the hobbyist or mm -hmm. the bedroom producer. I mean, you remember that plugin called Sausage Fattener? Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is like sort of a, it was almost kind of a joke, yeah, it was, yeah. but like it's well worth having in your collection because it will do some ungodly things to the, to the right sound. Yes. Yeah. And similarly, like these, there's a, an educator from New Zealand named Michael Norris who teaches computer science and DSP. And he has a set of plugins, which he releases for free. You can donate if you want on his website. They're called the uh, Sound Spectral, I believe is what they're called. It's a whole collection of sort of FFT-based plugins that, that are not necessarily versatile, but do things that no other tool that I've found will do. And I have, I actually have it up here because I'm such a fan of it. But, you know, I have, for instance, I have just a sort of, more or less ordinary type of string sound and if you add say a pitch shifter to knock it down an octave and then turn on one of michael norris's plugins i think this one's called uh, spectral drone maker and it will turn that ordinary ish string sound into somewhere in between a reverb and a pitch shifter. And it's, it's not necessarily, these tools aren't necessarily versatile, but I think it's really important to have not just the expensive or the good or the well-known stuff in your toolbox, but to keep looking under every rock for some weird gadget that might be the key to a certain piece of music. And whether it's the OTT compressor yeah. or these free spectral manipulation plugins, I mean, that's a, a very expensive string library put through a very <laughs> yeah. inexpensive plugin that, yeah. and the end result is something that is unexpected and very useful. And it's funny, like I always try to think about what sounds more expensive, you know, like in trailers, <laughs> you, want to, you want it to sound like money. Mm. So what does that mean, you know, from a sound perspective? And a weird one is like rolling off the high end, like degrading it. You listen to Hans Zimmer scores, all the high end is rolled off. And I was like, why would he do that? It's like so much rich, rich stuff in there. And when you compare it to something else, that roll off sounds heavier and like more confident or some, for some reason. And when you play around with all these plugins and whatnot, even just pitching down, format shifting, doing that kind of stuff. And even like, you know, tape emulators will do that. That sounds more expensive though you're doing the opposite of what it is in theory. Even though you're reducing yeah, exactly. the quality. So it's, it's yeah. a very interesting paradox in sound design. Um, and so I've been obsessed with that stuff. And uh, I mean, I'm all in the box, but what would you recommend for, let's say, like, like a tape emulation if we don't have a machine or... You know, uh, in, in terms of plug-in or hardware? I would start with plug-ins, yeah. The, my, f my favorite tape emulation plugin is e are either the ones from UA that run on the UAD mm -hmm. DSP hardware, or surprisingly, the Stephen Slate has a tape plugin yeah which runs on natively on the host and really has a thick turbo kind of sound. A lot of the Slate plugins are oriented towards modern rock kind of sound. Okay. So that's the, the type of gear they're trying to emulate, but it can be really effective at thickening up sounds that uh, are a little too nice. Okay. And it'll toughen them without ruining them. Uh, so let me ask you this trick question, but if you had to <laughs> demystify what you love about tape, what are the elements that you think it does that? Uh, you know, I was one of those guys who never loved the sound of analog mixing. Uh, we made many records on 
gigantic SSL consoles and we would fill up every freaking channel. But part of the problem I had with it was that the uh, it was a very delicate balance to getting the console pushed into the red or where it started to mm -hmm. fatten up without breaking up. Mm -hmm. And obviously using digital technology lets you have much more control over those aspects. But the good part of tape is, for me anyway, my favorite aspect of it was the not the sort of the, the roll off of highs or change in frequency response, but just this feeling of the the low the quiet stuff being louder and that there was this i don't know if that's saturation or tape compression mm -hmm. but that yeah. feeling of that you were reducing like you okay. were saying reducing yeah. the range yeah. of the fidelity and that was part of the complaint of early digital recordings i think was that it was almost too clean and yeah, it lacked dynamic, yeah. this character of of reduction and it's it's i'm quite satisfied with our ability these days to get into that zone mm -hmm. with software tools and whether they're plugins or running on the UAD yeah. DSP. So there are no tape decks in this room and there yeah. probably won't be. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I'm really also really happy with the stuff out there. And then again, I'll see a place of freebie. I think there's one by Isotope called Vinyl. Mm -hmm. Is it free? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I think yeah. it is, yeah. Um, but yeah, a cool thing, like I, I don't have like a perfect ear to recognize tape or anything. It's not really my generation, but what I love about it is that it has the um, pitch drift. So just the pitch, you know, moving a little bit. That adds, you know, tension and interest to your track. And then you has, you know, mech mechanical noises, you know. So again, just the ambient noise, it's better than white noise because there's a bit of interest, you know. It's kind of a grainy. Yeah. It's like uh, looking at a low resolution analog photo, you know. Yeah, there's more details. Um, whereas, you know, the static white noise is redundant and static. Well, so, it's yeah. interesting you mentioned that pitch warble because there was a, there was a sound that's very well known that's a piano sound at the end of the nine inch nail song closer that's yeah. got this it just feels like it's on its last legs it's pitch is wobbling and it's uncertain and it's warbling and uh i'm not 100 percent positive if it was made through this box but at one point in new orleans trent had a uh roland tape echo the rack mount version the r r e555 or something the black one with the orange lettering and it was broken or poorly maintained in such a way that the tape was sort of sticking on the cap stand okay. and the tape would kind of jump. Oh, dear, it wouldn't yeah. run smoothly. And there was a big piece of tape across the front that instructed us to make sure we didn't leave it turned on and that we did not try to repair it or <laughs> clean it or maintain it. They loved it. Because yeah. the way in which it was malfunctioning was exactly perfect. And I can't, like I said, I can't be 100% positive that mm -hmm. it was that box that made that warbling piano yeah. sound which was inspired by the piano on David Bowie's song, Ashes to Ashes, that has yeah. this sort of yeah. Boo, 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 boo. And, but I remember using that malfunctioning yeah. tape echo and it, it only did one thing, but it was a great thing. And it <laughs> was amazing. that, it had yeah. that, much like Isotope yeah. vinyl, had this uncertain pitch and to it. Yeah, it's also like, like I was trying to demystify, you know, old plugins, even you know, vintage compressors and, you know, vintage saturation is like, why is it, why is everyone obsessed with that? And I. So they talk, you know, Slate was talking about non-linearities. So non-linear, basically, uh, volume, pitch, saturation, and all these elements. So just all these little things moving without your control. And it's kind of like wilderness. And I think that's what we're kind of drawn into, yeah. If you think about, you know, the opposite, just like saw wave digital, if you just had that with like a sign kick and pure white noise, like to convey emotion, even with the best melody, you would be lacking something, mm. I think, yeah. Well, I've always been a fan of experimental instrument builders. There's one guy uh, who created a lot of the sample content for uh, Spectrosonic's Omnisphere, and who has some great videos on YouTube, a guy named Diego Stacco, who does things like he'll take a violin and a cello and saw them in half and glue them together again to make hybrid instruments. and. He might go to the hardware store and find interesting pieces of metal that sound cool when you strike them or bow the edge and that kind of thing. Um, and so I've always been a fan of those type of people. And of course, one classic example is the water phone. Designed by a, a hippie in, who lived in Hawaii, he wanted a device that he could use to talk to the whales. And uh, I'll just grab the boat. This guy named Richard Waters built this 
uh, so that he would walk out in the bay in Hawaii, bare naked, in a full moon, and lay this thing into the water, and then... create sounds which would travel through the water and the whales would sing to him at the full moon. And so, of course, it became the classic horror movie instrument as heard on every cliche, scary movie. But the first time I heard one of these, I thought, well, there's more to it than that. And one can, you don't have to have these jiggly, chaotic sounds. If you treat it right and play it right, you can find Tones which can be used in a pitched environment and aren't just atonal chaos. So it always sort of, it seemed for a while there that every film composer had one of these sitting on top of one of their speakers. So I do. But in that same world uh, comes a whole family of microtonal instruments or bowed metal instruments. And those, that was a family of sound that is similar to almost to that screeching subway train. It's metal on metal creating a pitch. And... I, when I was, in about 2003, when I was starting on the first uh, movie in the Saw series, I was introduced to a guy named Chaz Smith, who was one of the f students at Cal Arts in the golden years of the 70s when they had the best electronic music program around, and he was kind of in the right place at the right time to academically study microtonal music and early electronic music. Now he's in his 70s, but he still builds fantastic instruments for himself. And there's a bunch of YouTube videos of, of, of him demonstrating some of his instruments, um, which make for a long night of viewing. But when I was first introduced to him, he, dem he was demonstrating a few of his instruments. Um, he has one that's sitting in the corner, which is sort of a, an offshoot of the concept of the water phone. Um, it has metal rods, which you can bow. And he built it so that it can rotate and has bass guitar pickups mounted underneath it so that it picks up the sound electronically. And of course, as you create a tone and rotate the disc, the sound as it's picked up by both guitar pickups doesn't sound like it's rotating around your head. It sounds like it's <laughs> traveling through a hole that's been drilled between your ears. So he's into the, these microtonal metal instruments that he builds and of course, he fabricated this entire thing. Like, that's not a piece of hardware he bought. He made this. Um, and one of his other instruments that he had uh, built, which I used on the early Saw movies, was this thing that's over in the corner there. So this is the instrument called Kalasta, which was built by Chaz Smith. Uh, everybody should check him out on YouTube because he's got demonstrations of his insane collection of instruments that he built. And basically, it's a steel sheet made out of a stainless steel sheet a couple of piano strings which are stretched over these uh, pole posts which function almost as a bridge like the bridge on a guitar and uh, effectively pinch the sheet in between them there's a string on each side and so any vibrations that are created on the strings are transmitted into the sheet which acts almost like a plate reverb and gives a, a very large and cavernous sound even though we're in a small and dry room um, and so if you bow the strings, you get all kinds of pitch textures like this. And you can hear this sort of blooming effect from the sheet acting almost like a plate reverb. And then you can also use the bow on these little rods which stick out from the sides or on the sheet itself to create all kinds of haunting little textures. Sort of takes the concept of the bowed symbol into another galaxy, you know. But this instrument has kind of become a, a, a characteristic sound that's used in all the Saw horror movies and 
because it's kind of made out of rusty bits of scrap metal, it sort of fits the fits the ethos of those movies. Always been fascinated by instruments that are tonal ish but have an element of chaos and unsteadiness and and they can be f- manipulated to put them in pitch with a piece of music you're writing but they're n- hard to control or on the edge of being atonal and this exactly fits that kind of thing that doesn't need a lot of processing it just sounds like that and you, all you have to do is capture the sound and you're off and running The first time I heard it, I thought, that is the sound of a scary movie. It's in the same family as these bowed metal rod type instruments, but it has its own kind of thing going on. And uh, I was lucky enough that when he was moving a few years ago, he didn't have room for that one on the truck. So I managed to pry it out of his fingers. And it's become kind of a signature sound in all the Saw movies. And is really, uh, in fact, I think I have a sample of it nearby that I can pull up that really has an evocative, you know, just like you were saying, certain sounds conjure up a whole kind of uh, emotional response. And this one is no different. And in fact, there it is. And, uh, wow. It sounds somewhere between a creature, a, you know, a, a, a monster growling in his cave, and a musical instrument. It straddles that line between sound design and musical instrument. And those are much like the subway brakes squealing, those kind of sounds that are in between yeah. the two worlds. I think I always respond to them, but I think also audiences do too. They don't necessarily want to hear just sawtooth waves coming from a no, mini no. mode. And if something is interesting but originates in the real world, it's all the better, I think. And you know, a compliment to you and all the horror composers is that when I'm scared and I watch a horror movie, I don't do this, I do this. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, the sound Perfect. is the scariest thing. Like for the jump scare, it's more the sound that kind of gets mm-hmm. to you. And then that dissonance, that tension, I think like in our body, it must be like ingrained in us like since evolution, but dissonance stuff just, you know, the clash of harmonics just gets us on the edge of our seats, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and I think there was also a really cool one. Is it? Um, I think it was in The Conjuring, which is not even tonal. It just some sort of like noise hum. But the sound designer that did that one, 
I, you know what it is? It's an amp. I think that's it's like amp buzz, like with the cable yeah. half plugged in. But not even, not even no, no buzz like the tone. It's like it's on high gain and it's silent, so you hear just the uh, air breathing, mm. and you're like, this is about to blow up at any second. And that, like, maybe because it's in a rock band scenario, it just like puts you on the edge of your seat. Mm -hmm. Very, very powerful. So for AVA Instinct, that was my first library. So we were three. Uh, Clément Ducast and Scott Loudon. And this was my first really sound design project. I was initially a composer for their label, and they saw that I was doing all my sounds from scratch as I was writing, like just recording anything and just moving on. And they decided, okay, let's do a sound library with you. And I was like super excited. They flew me somewhere. That was the first time I got flown every, anywhere, you know. Um, and so I had pressure, you know, they invested money in me. I had to like prove myself. So uh, I just tried to record everything I possibly could. Uh, Detroit, the economy hit that place really bad because there was a car crisis and it was a big car manufacturer. So half of these places are empty. So abandoned churches, abandoned houses. Uh, so yeah, with no permits, we just went in, find some cool spaces. And ironically, that church that's iconic uh, in the video is made out of wood. So it's not reflective at all. So it's beautiful, but extremely dead. So when I hit a drum, it did not sound good. So for the trailer, I had to use an IR from like waves or something to like fit it <laughs> to match the picture. So it was all an illusion. Uh, but that goes to show you again, you, can, you don't have to record in a huge space. You know, you can use Altiverb, you can use Waves IR, you can use free IRs online and, you know, match a space that you want. Uh, and the thing I discovered though doing that was uh, the flaws of spaces. So you know how algorithmic reverbs are very uh, flat, they, you know, decay every frequency equally and you can choose a decay time, you know, the high, the lows. But with a room, you have, you know, every room doesn't sound as good. And you have, you know, nooks and crannies in the response. And for some drums, some IRs will, you know, boost 50 hertz, dip 100. And so if you put that on a drum that like is tuned to that room, it just magic happens, you know. Um, so that's what happened with AVA Instinct. That's where a lot of things clicked for me in sound design. And I realized you don't have to record, you know, at Abbey Road or, you know, Air Studios. Just, you know, in your bedroom, I think 75% of the library is probably synthesis. And then the organic layers are me tapping stuff and pitching down. Yeah. Don't reveal the secrets. Yeah, yeah. Of oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we have to cut everything. Um, but yeah, no, I hope it can inspire people to be like, yeah, it's more about the person making them than, you know, your microphone or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And the tool, you know, I, I, I'll say this to anybody who's coming up that the tools that we have access to now are so good for so such reasonable prices that the gear is no longer the kind of the barrier and it you know when i was coming up you had to be very careful about selecting which equipment was good because most of it was bad and so you had to research and of course this was before the internet yeah. so you're buying magazines and reading reviews and everything but i like to tell you know the analogy i give now is you'd have to walk into the music store drunk <laughs> and stoned and make a whole series of bad mistakes before you'd come out of there with equipment that actually yeah. would hold you back because it's poorly designed or sounds bad. Hundred so percent. It's I, I'm a big champion of just using whatever equipment can be afforded and fits your workflow. Yeah. As opposed to the one that is the holy grail microphone or whatever. Yeah, it's interesting. Earlier you were saying with so your sampler, what you love about it is how it flows with the interface, where you're just very simple. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be realistic, but as long as you can get what you have in your head done immediately fast, that probably has more values than Yeah, I'm all yeah. I'm I'm much more likely to use something that is effective and quick than something which is has a much wider range of features but may be more time consuming or difficult to operate. Mm -hmm. So even though at this point, after so many years, I can usually figure out even complex equipment, yeah. it's still in the heat of battle, it's much more fun and you have less chance of losing mm -hmm. the thread of where your idea is going if you can move quickly and efficiently. And it's funny, like in history, I'm sure even with Nine Inch Nails, a lot of the best songs are written, you know, in a day or less, you know, it might be a lot of production afterwards, but the core ideas need to happen really fast. Um, and I, even I'm, for trailers, the deadlines are, you know, less than 24 hours. 
it needs to sound like it's mixed and mastered to compete with anything. Uh, so yeah, for me, like ease of use, uh, like is really, speed. really, yeah, yeah, speed is key. And we talk also about flow states a lot where, yeah, you just get in a, you don't even think about your clicks, you know, nothing should get in your way, you know. Okay, so keeping it fresh, but basically generic enough so editors can work with it. So that's, first of all, a very, very big point. If you want to make it as a composer, is you have to understand how editors work and what they're looking for and how easy your song is to mangle. You know, if you're like a jazz guy that likes to modulate everywhere, you know, and I mean, Danny Elfman pulls it off, I don't know how, but Hans Zimmer stays in one key and he's known for being very editable because it's, you know, blocks kind of a pop structure. And trailer, it's that, but even a step further because they will cut your track into like billions of pieces and like you know i would have one fill like 30 seconds in and i use that at the end you know for the date release or something uh so first of all these editors are true wizards truly like musicians at their core i believe and uh the way to do that musically i think uh structure you don't really too much about it just make sure you have you know increases in energy levels and block them separately so let's say you have five energy levels distinct and the way to keep it fresh is you need to find a way so that in each part there's something unique about it where it's not just adding an instrument that is an extra octave on the ostinato you have to you know change the rhythms uh, maybe introduce a new signature sounds um, thinking stuff like this and also keeping it simple enough so you know the trailer drums are always the same always mixed kind of the same way uh, the rhythms are pretty similar, but everything in between needs to be a bit more nuanced. Um, yeah, so I think a good reference is pop music. Listening to a lot of that will help you actually write better trailer music. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll get a little more philosophical and just that it, even though uh, I, I, now I'm working on the ninth movie in the Saw franchise where certain elements of it need to be familiar. And there's one piece of music which always appears at the end I love that one. and gets yeah. longer and longer, it seems, each time, <laughs> um, but needs to always have something new, some new section to it, some new melody or some new key change added. But, and, and those kind of uh, aspects are almost m mechanical. Like, that's just sheer hard labor. It's not sort of head scratching of, hmm, how am I going to do this? Um, it's just a lot of mouse clicking that needs to be done. But when you say, uh, how do you keep it fresh? Uh, I'll go to a philosophical point and be like, what keeps it fresh for me is just being such a fan of sounds and always wanting to hear something I've never heard before. And I'm, this is, I'm sure, a big part of trailer music too, where it needs to be something that's never, no human ears have heard this sound until now that is the correct answer you can yeah. take away my take <laughs> <laughs> but and and yeah. that is kind of why i do this i didn't you know i started out as a drummer before being a keyboard player so i wasn't coming into this from a conservatory background learning orchestration and that sort of thing i came into this because of a thirst to hear sounds that i'd never heard before and whether that was you know at the age of nine or ten when I first saw Stanley Kubrick's 2001 and heard the Georgi Ligeti choir pieces with the insane dissonant clusters. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, that sound has an equal uh, importance to the, the latest synthesizer yeah. or wavetable gadget that we've just gotten. And it's just having that thirst to hear something that's never been heard before is that's what keeps me in the studio until three in the morning fiddling with stuff, trying, because I know there's still a universe of sound that none of us have heard yet, yep. and it's just waiting to be uncovered. And, you know, to, I, I, I don't quote Hans Zimmer very often, but he did say, he has one great quote, which is attributed to him. Someone asked him, what's his favorite piece of music that, of all the music he's written? And he said, the one I haven't written yet. Oh, that's And I thought that was very, yeah. it was very, I, I, I'm, I like to think that he didn't just shoot that one off the cuff. He probably had planned that <laughs> yeah. response, but it's a great way of looking at things and like, what's your favorite sound? The one I'm about to make. Yeah, I like that approach. 
Uh, but it's funny, back to where you're saying new Sonics, a huge influence to me was when I heard Beat It from Michael Jackson as a kid, that synthesizer, which was a synth clavier. Yep. That was new. I was like, whoa. And it's funny because it also has a trailer aspect because it's a signature sound, kind of a Bram function to introduce a song and not a trailer. But it functions in an oddly similar way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a lot more and more crossbreeding uh, nowadays. Um, and yeah, back to the Sonics, I think like with technology, we have such a horizon like to look for, like seems insane. Even just with, um, what is it? Synthesis is still pretty limiting, I think. And even the processing where now there's plugins, you know, like Morph, I don't know if you played with that one, where you can like mix, you know, harmonics, like harmonic behavior of two things together, you know. And the stuff from Krotos too, yeah. the Reformer and Reformer Pro that is, yeah. I think were originally aimed at sound designers where they could load in a sample of a tiger's roar and then do a live performance on a microphone mm -hmm. with their mouth and it would shape the sample to match what they were fitting. But if you repurpose some of those tools in a musical context, yeah. it's a whole, it's like you've just kicked down a door to a whole nother department of, of sound manipulation. Yeah, no, it's really, really exciting. Um, and I see even, you know, younger kids than me come up with new stuff that are using like stuff that I've never heard about, you know, so. Um, another plugin, I think, so Zenaptic is Morph. They also have, you know, Unveil, you know, which take mm -hmm. away, takes away reverb. So if you take like a sound that's very reverby that you've never heard dry like thunder and try that on that and you get, whoa, that's like an interesting, you know, texture. What I'm most excited about is new hardware that lets us control all of this insane technology. You know, a, a friend of mine, uh, was all hot and heavy on the uh, Touche by Expressive E, the little, mm -hmm. which is very useful in a variety of situations. Useful to add expression to orchestral performances. We're using samples, manip or manipulating the filter on your synth, whatever. But recently, they came out with a, a very simple and basic set of instrument plugins that are there, physically modeled cello, violin, and viola. But the, and the combination of those two, if you load up their plugin and just play it from the keyboard, it, it sounds a little artificial, it's a little strange. But when you were able to con physically control the thing yeah. without thinking about it, without planning ahead and drawing in mod wheel controls and, yeah. and, and typing in the data, but are able to just sort of close your eyes and bang and hit and rub this thing, yeah. those, those kind of uh, performance controls are a huge... They, they just they reduce the ta the gap between what you're thinking and what you're hearing and I think that's a, an area that I mean, it's great to see whether it's things like the Roly mm -hmm. keyboards or the Expressive E Touche and their new keyboard that's coming out this summer the Osmos those kind of real-time performance uh, devices are really like a great horizon you know things like I have a Sensel Morph which is just a simple XY controller but allows you to cut down that time between, okay, here's what I want to do, now how do I do it? And it lets you just perform these complex things in a real-time pass, even if you have yeah. stumbling level of keyboard abilities. But those, those technologies that enable the performance, uh, yeah. I think are a great horizon. And it's funny because it kind of answers the problem with physical modeling, which is too complicated. And if you use an interface, it's like, team up these two ideas yeah. and you have money. <laughs> And it was yeah. also a way that, that for people that are wondering why that touche from Expressive E was so useful, they might say, well, it's an amazing feat of technology and engineering, but what could I use it for? But then when they see even the, how, it, how it will take a simple physical model cello sound mm -hmm. and turn it into a very expressive thing that would be mm -hmm. almost impossible to achieve with samples, then then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and they think, yeah. and I could use that. And that was exactly my reaction to it. I've always been a fiendish collector of sample libraries, of whether they're the high-end orchestral products from companies like Orchestral Tools uh, to samples of cheap drum machines or whatever. So I have, I'm, I'm a bit of a sample hoarder, but when it comes to uh, the type of music that I wind up writing, it a lot of times doesn't need to be a, an accurate simulation or mock-up of a real orchestra, but I do want to take advantage of that world of sound. And so 
I, I have all the orchestral tools products, I'm proud to admit, <laughs> uh, but I will go fishing through them to find just those sounds and articulations that are exciting to me. And it might be a, a sul ponticello tremolo where I can just get the, per, the just the right character of an icy, icy cold string note. Or it might be uh, the sort of uh, the stuff that's in time macro, these evolving textures, which are still have an organic footprint and they don't sound like some far out wavetable experiment, but they still have something that, like I was saying before, something we haven't heard before and that has an interesting character and that will evoke some kind of emotional response in the part of the listener or victim, as the case may be. Right. So I have a way less interesting answer. But no, it was, I think, in Metropolis Arc, some of the low strings where you had more double basses than cellos. I think Alex Mukala also mentioned that. That's one patch where I just clicked on it and I was like, whoa, there's something going on. And so, I mean, for trailer stuff where you're just looking to get that huge size, you know, uh, which doesn't always come from the number of players and samples, it just needs to be really well mixed, really real, well arranged that really, really like hit the nail on the head for the trailer sound. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I played also in Majestic Horns, $2 library, but if you process it, the raw recordings are really fun. Great to make brands. And then you have also free stuff now, I think with layers. So I need to check that out. But uh, yeah, really happy with the company and also looking forward to Junkie XL Brass. Well, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.